I am wearing dramatic clothes. We are shooting with dramatic lighting. I am staring deep, deep into the camera. That is because today is the day we must paint. I don't want to paint this thing. Don't make me! Welcome back to the channel, everybody. My name is Garmin. This is the Storycraft Society, and this week we are finally finishing up this house. It has been over the last few weeks that I have been using this series of YouTube videos to get this thing done, and today is the final video in this series. I am so ready to be done with this thing and have it ready to go on my table, but there is one major, major hurdle that I have to get through to get this thing onto my table, and that is I have to paint it. And anybody who has watched this channel for more than one video will know that painting is my least favorite thing in this process. I guess I should say. There's things that are worse than painting, arguably. But in this process, I get the building looking all pretty. It's all finished, it's ready to go. And then it's time to paint and guess what? I hate it, so we need to just get into it. So I'm gonna stop talking and we're gonna dive into what I have to do. The first thing that I've gotta do is get all of the wooden pieces off of this that will come off of this. Some of them are anchored down by the tile grout and stuff, but anything that can come off that is a wooden piece, I'm taking off. And then I need to get my Black Magic Craft base coat over the whole thing. For those who don't know, Black Magic Craft base coat is a 50-50 mixture of black acrylic craft paint and matte Mod Podge. That is going to be my base layer because one, it's gonna strengthen up the foam and the paper shingles. Two, it's going to give me my flat black base coat that's underneath of everything so I can start painting up from there. And I'm gonna use a little bit of water and that to make sure that I get over all of the nooks and crannies, doing my best to avoid the areas that have wood that is already painted. So for the most part, I can just kind of slap this stuff on, but there's gonna be a couple of little areas where I need to be real precise and tricky. But once I have that done, then I will check back in with you and we will jump into the actual painting process. So on the channel, I've covered painting before, so I'm not gonna go super in detail about what I do, but I will share colors and little tricks and things that I picked up along the way. The one thing that I will also say is that I jump around a lot because in this video, I am going to cover the steps that I took in the actual order that I took them. So I, I, I jump around a good bit, but this is the actual order with which I finished this project. So starting with base coats, I put a charcoal brown all over my stonework and I put a craft smart brown all over my timbers. These are going to be very, very watered down because the goal is to get a lot of color variants from the black undercoat up into the paint. So this is almost like a wash that doesn't settle in the low areas, but just kind of lays all over everything. The next thing that I did was my mid-tones on my stone and my wood pieces. And just as a clarification, both times that I've said wood pieces so far, I mean, the foam wood pieces, not the actual wood pieces. <laughs> That's a little confusing. Um, but for my mid-tones of the stone, I used a pewter gray. For the mid-tones of my foam wood pieces, I used a territorial beige. Now to apply both of these, I used a wet overbrushing to make sure that I kept some of the dark areas and I definitely used a wet brush and thinned down paint just a little bit so that I still got some color variation with what was down below. And that gives me right in my mid-tone three areas of color from the black undercoat to my base coat now to my mid-tone. I moved over to base coating my stucco next and I used a raw sienna for that. Again, just like I did with the stone and the foam timbers, I watered this way, way, way down to make sure that I'm getting as much color variation as I possibly could. The next thing that I did was highlight all of my stone and foam timbers. For my stone, I used an elephant gray and English ivy green mixture. I wanted the stone for this to have just a little bit of a mossy look to it and an implied green. So a good way to do this is by mixing interesting colors into your grays to get just a little bit of color variation. For the foam timbers, I ended up using a highlight of khaki and then I applied both of these with a light overbrushing. This is not gonna be watered down paint at all. It's just gonna be straight paint, but I am using a wet brush and I overbrushed over the whole 
thing. I'm gonna use that same khaki that I just used for the wooden timbers as my mid-tone for my stucco. And again, I'm gonna have this watered down just a little bit, and I'm gonna go over all of the stucco areas with a light overbrush to make sure that I'm getting not down into the deepest, darkest areas, but that I'm getting a nice, even coverage over the middle areas and the high areas. The last thing that I do for the stucco is a highlight of antique white. This is gonna be way too bright, but we'll get to darkening that here in a second. But with this, I did a light overbrushing over the whole thing, but I tried to use thin down paint so that I got a little bit of color variance inside of the bright antique white. To darken down the stucco, I actually just pull out seraphim sepia and put that all over the stucco. This is my favorite way of getting the stucco to look deep and 3D in texture. Although I will say, I think in the future, I'm gonna start cutting my washes with something because I, the dark areas are just a little too dark for my taste. Even with this, I think I would have preferred maybe a little bit watered down of a wash instead of just a straight wash here. Now, while all that was drying, I moved on to painting my wooden bits, like the doors and window coverings. So I'm gonna use the exact same paint that I used for all of the already actual wood pieces that are on here, which is snake bite leather contrast paint. This is my favorite way to stain real actual wood pieces that are going onto my buildings and terrain. And it just goes on really, really, really well and looks really good right out of the pot. Doing the doors and windows like that is a really easy step, but now I had to move on to the harder step, which is doing the shingles. So I started my shingles with a super watered down coat of territorial beige. I followed that up by another watered down coat of territorial beige mixed with khaki. And then I did a mid-tone dry brushing of khaki mixed with antique white. Now I'm showing off my paper towel here because I just want to remind you that getting wood shingles, something that has a lot of color variation, I think benefits from play of you adding a lot of different colors in and more coats of paint typically will result in better looking texture. So the final result that I ended up settling on really required me to play around with the color a lot and this is what I ended up with. But I will say that at this point, the shingles were looking way too bright. That's okay. What I did was I pulled out an Agrax Earthshade dark brown wash, and I'm gonna put that all over the shingles to bring all of that color depth back in and the dark areas to get them looking dark again. So with the majority of the painting done, I now have this little hook there and this space for this window, and then the window, which is going to fit up in here. But what I'd like to have happen is I'd like for there to be like a little string that connects the window. So it looks like, you know, it's like a pulley that holds the window up. So what I need to do is I need to get the string attached here and up there. So for scale rope, I end up using this thread. I used to use twine and it was just always a little too thick. So I like this thread because it just fits the scale that I'm going for just a little tiny bit better. I did take my craft saw and I sawed a little area that is really imperceptible to the eye unless you're really looking for it, but into all of my windows that are going to be hung with this rope. That is gonna be my way that I can slot that string down into it without it being a huge mess or having to drill holes or anything like that. I tie a knot in the end of the string, that way it doesn't pull through my little notch, or I guess it would pull through my little notch if I really tried to force it, but it will hold itself if I don't really try to force it through. And then I'm gonna put Elmer's glue onto that string that's going to lock that into that little nook just perfectly. While the string was drying in all of my windows, then I moved on to attaching the doors. I'm gonna be using Elmer's glue for that as well. And this is one of those reasons why it's really nice to make sure that your wooden bits fit into the foam pretty snug because the foam will expand just a little bit to let the wood piece fit in. And it also kind of works as its own clamp that it'll just hold itself in place a little better. So what I did was I put a seam of Elmer's glue down in the corner and then put my door in place 
and just let that dry. It's the exact same thing for mounting the windows. I'm just gonna put that Elmer's glue right into the seam and then push that up into place. But the windows are a little bit more complicated in the fact that now I need to get that rope up and around the eyelet. I definitely needed tweezers to be able to do this job correctly. And what I did was use those tweezers to wrap three times around the eyelet with the string. That was kind of the average point that I felt like it was snug enough that it wasn't gonna do anything silly on me. And then I tied one quick little knot in the string and that allowed me to know that it was secure in place. Once it was looking the way that I wanted it to look, I took and put a little bit of Elmer's glue on top of the knot. That really locks it up and makes sure that it's not gonna come untied. And then from there, I pull very lightly, keyword there is very lightly down on the window to make the rope look like it has tension. That's important because if the rope is loose, it won't look right because it won't look like the weight of the window is holding it in place. So um, you just have to be real careful and lightly pull that down so that the string slash rope looks like it is carrying a load. To weather the rope, I actually just pulled out Pallid Bone, which is a color of speed paint, and I'm just gonna put that all over the string once all the glue is dry. Honestly, this is a very, very easy step, and I absolutely love using the contrast speed paints to do this kind of a job, because one quick coat with a brush, and it's all ready to go. And actually, I couldn't be more happy with how these look. They look really, really solid once they dry. Moving on to the roof. What I needed to do is get moss all over my shingles. That's gonna do two things for me. The first thing that it's gonna do is make them look awesome. But the second thing is it's going to cover up any mistakes or areas that I am not super happy with. What I'm gonna do is pull out two colors of Woodland Scenics Flock. It's going to be Green Blend and Burnt Grass. And those two colors are gonna get mixed together in a cup, leaning towards the burnt grass side. And that is going to give me my color flock that I'm gonna put up onto the roofs. I actually don't know if I said this or not, but this is to simulate moss on those wooden shingles. Good thing to mention. <laughs> Now to get that ready to apply, I'm going to mix together watered down Elmer's glue and Elmer's glue to make this into a paste. The reason I like the watered down Elmer's glue is that allows it to soak up into this foam flock. And then I like the regular Elmer's glue because it sticks a little better. But what I'm gonna do is mix that up so that it is nice and mixy into a paste, but it is not so much that it's all glue and so little that it's dry. There's a specific area right in between that I like to go for with this. And the more you play with it, the more you will find what that mix is for yourself. To apply it, I pull out a small putty knife and then I'm just gonna start slapping this onto the roof. This is one of those jobs that I can't say this enough, you cannot mess it up. Every time I put it on, I'm like, oh no, it looks terrible. And then it dries and I'm like, wow, this is actually pretty great. So don't be afraid, you cannot mess this up. Just put it in little clumps in random places all over your roof, some big thick, whoa some big thick patches, some smaller little areas, keep it kind of all over, but not so much that it covers all of your wood shingles and you'll be good to go. Once I had the moss on, I realized that the exposed rafters where the shingles had flaked off was an area that didn't look quite weathered enough. So what I'm gonna do is pull out Agrax Earthshade and I'm gonna put that in between all of the roof slats to look like the wood is starting to get moldy and rotten in those areas where water could seep in. Now you'll notice, I focus this on the seams that will give me horizontal visual diversity, but also that's the area where these planks would gather up the most moisture. Then once I've got that, I wanna simulate a little bit of like, algae is not the right term, but like growth, green stuff happening in those areas. So what I'm gonna do is pull out a Thonian camo shade and I'm going to take and do that exact same thing to get a little bit of green to mix with that brown. To get the stucco all weathered up, I'm going to take out that Thonian camo shade again and I'm gonna put that in all of the areas that would pull a little bit of moisture, but also I'm gonna put it in the corners just to get a little bit of green showing up in the yellows 
of that stucco. This is one area where I'm not gonna want this to pool. I'm just gonna want it to be a nice thin coat that adds a little bit of color diversity into those areas. Then I'm gonna do the exact same thing on the stonework, but I'm going to use Agrax Earth Shade so that it gets me a little bit of runoff areas. And this is one where I'm specifically going to be targeting areas where water would continually run down over and over and over on the stonework. This could be where a stone sticks out or where a windowsill is. This is just a fun one that you get to play and add little water stains into the stonework. But seriously, I could not be more thrilled with the result of this project. This was a house that until I did this series of YouTube videos, it was just sitting on my shelf and it wasn't gonna get used because I couldn't kick myself in the butt enough to get it done, but I am so glad that it is done now. And take this as a challenge to all of you. There is a project on your shelf that you are dragging your feet to get done. This is me from the other side. D do it now, <laughs> because even if you're just doing one little tiny piece, just do one little small area of it today and then one little small area of it tomorrow, you will eventually get it done and it feels really good on this side of the project. I want to say thank you to whoever the original artist was who did this building that gave me the inspiration to even start it. Like I said, I still can't figure out who it is. I'm not sure if anybody's left anything into the comments to let me know. Just with the way that the videos are filmed, I haven't seen what you all said about the first video yet. That's the strange part about YouTube and filming stuff in the past and then releasing them in the future. <laughs> but I wanna say thank you to the Foam Modeling Workshop community because they always are giving me awesome things to be inspired to make that result in things that look like this. Thank you so much to everybody who watches these videos. Hopefully you enjoy them as much as I enjoy making them. I guess the only other thing that I can say is do all the YouTube stuff, subscribe to the channel if you haven't, like, comment on this video, share this video with a friend that you think would enjoy it. That's the number one way that you can help out a small YouTube channel. And don't just do that for my channel, do that for everybody's channel. All of the small creators, they would appreciate the shares more than anything. But that's it for this week. Thank you so much for joining me on this little crafting journey. And uh, until next week, I'll be seeing you.